Today, in our second talk, we will speak about the benefits, advantages, or value of having a new life. What we'll be talking about includes also the words, the meaning of the words, the flavor, the attractiveness, or we can say the charm of a new life as well. So please be interested in the different meanings of these, these different words to, in order to get a proper understanding of this subject. The language we use can be a bit of an obstacle. Sometimes the words we need don't exist or the words we have aren't enough or sometimes the, the meanings of the words that we do have in use aren't enough or aren't quite correct. And so because of the limitations of language, we have to use many words in order to express what we're talking about. So please listen carefully in order to get the most benefit from this, these words. A good example of the difficulties and ambiguities of language is the word happiness. This is a word everybody is familiar with, but the common meaning of this word, happiness, is something, although people get very excited and interested by it, is something that really doesn't do us a whole lot of good. When we start to get interested in peace and calm, then we have to find some something that is higher or beyond happiness and that or beyond this everyday common meaning of happiness but that thing that is beyond happiness we can call that happiness also so this is where the language gets a bit ambiguous we have to use the same word but it has two very different meanings the common happiness that people are chasing around after and which is all caught up in being happy over positive attractive things and then the kind of happiness that is beyond positive and beyond the ordinary happiness this is something much different and so we call this real happiness true happiness in order to distinguish it from the common understanding of happiness. But still we have to use the same word and sometimes people miss the, the important distinction. So please listen to this carefully. Even if we call this thing that is above regular happiness, even if we call it true happiness, genuine happiness, or real happiness, it still has a positive sound to it. We still think of it in a positive way. And this is not quite appropriate for the new life, which is above, which is beyond positive and negative, beyond all of these dualisms. And so, to say even real happiness can mislead us. It's very difficult to find the right word to express what we're talking about. The languages we have to use are very limited, but we'll, for the sake of today's talk, allow us to use the word Nibbana instead of this word true happiness. When we talk about the thing which is higher than happiness or beyond 
the highest happiness better than the best happiness, allow us to use the word Nibbana or the Sanskrit Nirvana. We'd like you to have a new word to use in your vocabulary, even if it's a bit of a strange word that you've never heard before. We would like you to to try out this new word because it will uh, it'll be very useful for you. In Thai, this word is Nipan, Nipan, or in Pali, Nipana, or in written in the West, we pronounce it more Nibana, and then in Sanskrit, Nirvana or Nirwana. But we'll just use the easy Thai word, Nipan. It's short and to the point. Nipan. Even if it's a little difficult for you, please remember this word and get familiar with it in order to understand it more and more. Nipan. Nipana. We'll begin by giving the definition of the word Nipan to help you start to understand it. And as you begin to understand this definition, then you can figure out for yourself whether it is positive or not. If we start with the roots of the word Nipan, the, the literal or origins of the word. It means the quenching of heat, the extinguishing, the putting out of heat, or the quenching of heat, the quenching of thirst, the quenching of dukkha. This is the literal meaning of the word nipan. If we examine, we'll see that the word quenching and extinguishing are somewhat different. The word quenching still has a bit of a positive quality to it. It's a bit more interesting or attractive to us, whereas the word extinguishing or extinction doesn't sound as if it has much positive about it. So we'd like to go back to the way this word Nipan was used in the Buddha's time or even before that to see the kind of meaning it had then. And at that time, we it seems to us that the word quenching is more appropriate. It's the quenching of heat. The things that are hot, you can find that out, and you have been finding that out for yourself. And the quenching of all those hot things is the meaning of Nipan. But it's merely a quenching of the heat. It's not a getting rid of or destruction of. It's not to for it, everything to disappear. It's just for the heat, for the, for the suffering, for the desire and thirst to be quenched. We should be very careful with the word Nipan to understand that it doesn't have anything to do with death. Some people have gotten carried away and assume that Nipan means death. Even in Thailand, many people have this incorrect understanding. Be, so be careful that Nipan doesn't have anything to do with death. Nipan is the quenching of heat. Death, death doesn't quench anything. Death can't quench anything. But Nipan can. It is the the cooling down, the quenching of things that are hot and of heat. The realization of Nibbana is a transition or a change from the state of heat to the state of coolness. 
and that's all. There's nothing in there that has to do with death. And then once, once Nibbana has been realized, then there's no need to die. In Nibbana there is no death. So Nibbana and death have no relationship to each other whatsoever. Please understand this before we go any further. The word Nippon in the Buddha's time was a very common and ordinary word. It was a household word. For example, when a fire would cool down, it was said to Nippon, the fire Nippons, or a bowl of soup or a pot of rice that is just been cooked and is too hot to eat. We must wait for it to nippon before it is cool enough for us to eat. Or a goldsmith who has to heat up the gold in order to work it and then sprinkles water on it to cool it. That is to make the gold nippon. Nippon in this ordinary sense just means for the dissipation of heat, for something to cool down. It's a very common word. It could also be used for wild animals brought in from the jungle and then trained until they were tame or until they were Nippon. And it can be used for a lifestyle for human beings that was also cool and comfortable and peaceful. So it was a common everyday word. What the Buddha did, instead of invent a new word that people might not understand at all, he just took this common word, Nippon, and gave it a new, higher, very special spiritual meaning. But it's the roots of this word are very common and ordinary. The the vocabul the Dhamma vocabulary we use is full of words like this that come from the everyday language of of the common people in the Buddha's time. All kinds of words, such as the word kama or karma. This was a common ordinary word that was given a very special meaning in, in spiritual or in Dhamma terms. There are many other such words. Even the word Dhamma was an ordinary word back in those days. But then it was given a special meaning. And then there was, of course, the word Nippon. Other words such as a walkway or a pathway was called maga and that's what we call now we use that word path or maga to mean the path to nibbana and there are many many words like this if we can understand these different words and especially the word nippon in the original ordinary meaning then it's very easy to understand the special Dhamma meaning of them. In those days, Nippon merely meant the quenching of the heat. And this meaning can be compared with the word dukkha, which is, which is always compared with heat. The word dukkha doesn't mean heat, but often the words come together. And even in Thailand today, we find the word tukka and hot or heat or hotness used in combination. We say that something is hot dukkha or so, and so forth. And so the quenching of that heat, the quenching of dukkha is the meaning of nipan. But there's an even higher, more profound meaning of nipan which we'd like to go into a bit. In this, <clears throat> this 
nipan or the quenching of heat this is what prevents us or keeps us from dying think about this very carefully if we were hot all the time if we were always hot always caught up in dukkha and desire and thirst if we were constantly hot like this then we would very soon die it's only because of nipan the quenching of this the heat that we are able to survive and we wouldn't have lasted this long if it wasn't for nibbana so nipan or nibbana is on one level the quenching of heat but we can also see it as the sustainer of life through which we survive it's that which preserves life and allows us to survive this is a very subtle and important understanding of nipan that is often overlooked without this we would not be alive we could not be here now if it wasn't for the quenching of heat not death not the quenching of life but just the quenching of heat that allows us to truly live this really deserves your attention because if we were thirsty all the time if we were constantly thirsty before very long we would die if there was nothing in our life except thirst and hunger and heat we wouldn't last for more than a few hours have you reflected on this before it's very very important it's because of nipan the quenching of this heat the quenching of thirst and desire that we're able to rest to relax and to sleep at night this is only through nipan that we can even get a decent night's sleep if there was only thirst and hunger and heat we wouldn't be able to go to sleep at night very soon we'd start having all kinds of neuroses we'd go crazy and very soon we would die without nipan to cool this heat we can't survive so nipan is that which sustains preserves and nourishes or nurtures life allowing us to survive it's this quenching of heat of thirst of craving and hunger through which we survive this is the most profound meaning of nipan that needs to be understood so nibbana is that which allows us to survive think think about in one day in 24 hours how many hours is there nipan and how many hours is there heat or thirst and hunger maybe nipan comes in little bits and for small periods of time or maybe there are even longer periods of coolness of quenching in which there is no heat or thirst think about this in one day in 24 hours how much nipan is there and how much heat we can we can say that there's at least enough nipan to survive that's obvious for all of us all of us who are are still surviving there's enough nipan for us to survive so please take a look at this and develop some respect and gratitude for nipan because this is the thing that keeps us alive and we ought to be very thankful for it but there are some fools who go and translate nipan to mean death and these poor people have got it all backwards nipan is in death but it's that it's the opposite of death it's that which allows us to live to survive and so it's something that deserves our gratitude and so the meaning of new life is a life that is much more quenched 
than the old life. The old life is very hot and in new life there is a lot of quenching or maybe even total quenching so the heat has been completely quenched. This is the difference between old life and new life. If you can understand this that the new life is a life in which there is a great deal of quenching then you will be able to see the direction in which we we are headed we need to go and you can see then the the true purpose and benefit of vipassana of insight meditation of learning to see things as they really are this is in order to for quenching for a new life a life that is the life of quenching quenching the heat until it is completely and totally quenched this is the purpose or the value of vipassana we ask that you just learn this word nipan or if you prefer the pali nibbana instead of translating it because if we start translating it it gets easier and easier to get the meaning wrong so let's just stick with the simple word nipan and understand its meaning correctly and the the first meaning to understand of nipan is the thing which sustains and preserves life it keeps it quenches the heat enough so that life can continue or so that life can be cool this is the first understanding of nibbana to remember the second point to understand about nipan is that it is the samam banam of buddhism we can use this this latin word samam banam because it's well understood by westerners and should be familiar to you to you all Sum, the samam banam of buddhism is nipan samam banam or the the utmost goodness the highest good which man can get or which women can get whichever you prefer this in buddhism is nip nipan we can take the the general ethical understanding of samam banam if we wish or we can we can take higher higher levels often samam banam or the the highest good the utmost good which humanity can get is described as happiness but we've already discussed today about the vagueness or the confusion that can arise regarding the word happiness and so in buddhism we prefer not to to say that the samam banam is happiness unless you understand that the samam the happiness if you un- unless you understand that the buddhist samam banam is the happiness of nibbana if you want to say that the utmost goodness is happiness then please understand that it's the happiness of nibbana if in talking like this if you wonder why it has to be limited to buddhist and you might want to prefer that it's just the the sumam banam of all humanity well you're welcome to think that way in fact that's what we think that this sumam sumam banam of nipan is not limited just to buddhists it's available to all humanity and so in fact we would say that the highest good the utmost good that humanity can get all humanity and not just buddhists is nipan this is the second point to understand there are a lot of high sounding words 
such as unique and supreme. But the question always comes back to, are these things beyond good or goodness? When we say unique or supreme, is it beyond good or is it only just good? When we, we talk about the utmost goodness, we're forced to do this by language. We don't have any other words to use. So we have to use these words, utmost goodness or supreme or unique or whatever. And so it's important how we understand these words. When we're talking about Nippon, we're talking about something that is beyond good. It's, it's beyond evil and it's also beyond good. Nippon is no longer trapped in these distinctions of evil and good. It's above, it transcends good. But still in the end we don't have any other word to use so we're still stuck with the word the best or the utmost goodness. We can't get free of these words. So we just have to understand them correctly. If it's really supreme then it transcends good and evil. If it's really unique, then it must be beyond, completely un, untouched by, by the good as well as the evil. This is what we mean by Nibbana. It's no longer caught up, even though we say the word good or goodness or the highest good, the utmost good, the supreme good even though we use this word. What we're talking about is something that transcends, is beyond, outside of the, the meaning of the word good and goodness. It, it doesn't have the value, it, it doesn't have the quality or the limitations of this word good and the word goodness. So we're using these words because they're the only words we've got. And it's a shame that we have to because it often tricks people. People are often deceived by these words because they don't take the time to develop the correct understanding. And so today we're trying to, to point out how we're using these words in order to understand them correctly. Nibbana is the utmost good which is so good that it's beyond good. It has nothing to do with good. But we still end up calling it the best or the most good because what else can we say? Human beings have words for the things that they know. The things that we know about we have words for and things we don't know about we don't have any words for. And so there are things that are good, that we value, that we like, which we call good. We've got plenty of words for these things because we know what they are. We know what we think is good. And so we've got the words for this. But when we want to talk about something that is beyond good, we don't have the word for it. We've only got the old words about what is good and evil and all that. So, if we start to conceive of or start to have a need for a word that means beyond good, it's not there. If either through our thinking and reasoning and speculation or through direct experience, we, we start to conceive of or think about something which is beyond good, which transcends good, we don't have the word and so we're stuck using the word good for this thing which is beyond good or we say the best or the the utmost goodness. This is because we just have to use the same old words that we we have. If we come and make up new words all the time it will confuse people too much and so we use the words that we've got. But when we talk about Nippon in this second meaning, when we're talking about that which is above good, above evil, beyond and outside of good and evil, 
you'll see that we're talking about something quite different than the ordinary meaning of the word good. And so please, please take a look at this. When we talk about Nibbana as the utmost quenching, it's the quenching of evil and the quenching of good as well. Think, think about these things. You ought to take a look at these, the thing that would be beyond evil and beyond good, above sin and above virtue, beyond the positive and beyond the negative. The thing that transcends all of these things. This is the utmost quenching of Nippon. So when you want to talk about that which is beyond good and beyond evil, which transcends them, now we've got a new word with which to talk about them. This is Nippon. Nippon is that thing. And you can understand Nippon to be the quenching of good and evil. This is a new word we now have in order to talk about the thing that transcends all good and all evil which is beyond them. The quenching of good and evil or Nippon. This is the highest thing, the supreme thing. There's nothing higher than this. This is so high that it's higher than high or Nippon, the quenching of good and evil. This is a word we hope you can remember and use and consider. Nippon in its second, second meaning. We should observe that good is hot. Goodness is hot. And of course, evil is hot as well. Both good and evil are hot. They have heat. And so, the quenching of good and evil is coolness, is Nippon. We should look at all these dualisms, all the pairs of opposites we've got. Not just good and evil, not only these are hot, but all dualisms, all these dualistic pairs are hot. And the quenching of them is Nibbana. Especially the, the biggest dualism of all, the dualism of positive and negative. Positive is hot and negative is hot. Both of these are full of heat and the quenching of them is Nippon. For the positive we can say that it's a wet heat. The negative is a dry heat. If you observe these, these things you'll see what we mean. But the quenching of them, the cooling of them, is to be free of that heat, to be Nippon. All the dualisms, all these pairs, good and evil, sin and virtue, positive and negative, they're all hot. But then there is the quenching of them, or Nippon, which is not hot at all. This is what we should study, study the hotness of all these dualisms and the, the quenching of Nippon. You ought to study every one of these pairs of opposites until you see that each and every pair is, is hot. Each of them has heat, there is heat within them, and they are hot. The, the pair of positive and negative, both of these are hot or good and evil. These are hot. If you studied the Bible, you are well aware about this, this first dualism which God warned Adam and Eve about. He said, don't attach to these things because they're hot, but we're attaching all the time. Or any gain in loss. Gain is hot. Loss is hot. Victory and defeat both of these have heat. There within them is heat, is hotness. In any other pair you can think of, all these dualisms have heat, they're hot. The, the pairs of merit and demerit, or sin and virtue, 
no matter what meaning you give to these pairs, whether it's from an Asian perspective or a Western perspective, still they're hot. They're, these dualistic pairs are every one of them hot. There are dozens of these, but take the time to study them and see that each and every one of them is full of heat. They're all hot. They're burning. Even happiness and unhappiness or joy and suffering, these are hot as well. We all know that pain and suffering and unhappiness is hot, but we often overlook that this ordinary happiness that we're so often deceived by. This common happiness is hot as well because it leads to all kinds of desires and problems. So even happiness, the ordinary happiness, is full of heat, is hot. All these dualisms, back to the, the big one of good and evil, or positive and negative, they're all hot. When we see this, then we can start to see the value of quenching all this heat in order to, to discover Nippon, or a life that is cool a cool life. There's another word that can deceive us, just like the words good and happiness. And this is the word cool, which we just used. We often talk about coolness or the cool life, but we can, we can be deceived by this word cool as well. When you hear the word cool, you're thinking about the opposite of hot, then we can very easily get trapped in another dualism and get caught up in these attachments again. When we're talking about cool, okay, heat means a lot of temperature and cool just means a lower temperature or maybe cold, a very low temperature. But if coolness in the way you're understanding it still has some temperature, then it's just another, it's just an opposite to heat. And then we've got a dualism and the mind is, <clears throat> and that's not the coolness that we're talking about. So when the cool or coolness we're talking about here is not a coolness that has temperature, except to say that it has no temperature wouldn't be quite right either. We once again, we don't quite know how to put it. But the coolness we mean here is a coolness that is beyond cool or outside of cool. It transcends both hot and cool. This is the coolness we mean when we're talking about Nippon or a cool life. It's not, it's not a dualistic cool. It's a cool that's outside of and beyond the ordinary understanding of coolness. So be careful about even this word. It can be deceptive, just like the words good or happy. When you think of the thing which is beyond all duality, that transcends all of the dualisms of good and evil and so forth, then think of the word Nippon. This is what Nippon means, this state that is beyond all these dualisms. And so this is the understanding of Nibbana that we are trying to get across here. When we say Nippon, of course, we don't mean something that's caught within the duality of good and evil. But if we want to say, so when we say that Nippon is the summum banum of <coughs> Buddhism, we should see that it's not, it may not be exactly the summum banum of the Romans. Maybe in the Latin language they didn't have a word like beyond good. They didn't have this word above good. And so their idea of the summum banum was still a dualistic kind of good. Maybe they didn't have a word like Nippon, and so the best they could think of was the utmost 
goodness. But in, in Buddhism, we have a word that is beyond that. We want to express something that is beyond merely being good, something that transcends both evil and good. And so we have the word nipan. So when you're thinking of this state, of, of coolness, of quenching that is outside of and beyond the power and influence of all the dualities of any pair of opposites, then think of Nipan. This is the sumambanam of the, the particularly or peculiar, the peculiar sumambanam of Buddhism. We've got an, another way to look at this to help you understand. When you're hungry, you need something to satisfy the hunger, and then the hunger is quenched. When you, when you have a hunger, you go and eat something or, or find whatever it is to satiate that hunger, and then you have the quenching of that hunger. <clears throat> but also there's the state when you're not hungry at all when there's no hunger at all. Now think about these two. Which is more quenching? Which is a higher order of quenching? Where you have to go out and find something to consume or eat in order to satisfy the hunger or the, the complete absence of hunger? Which of these is more quenching? When we talk about Nibbana, it's the second kind of quenching. This, when there's no, no hunger, no thirst, no desire. If there's still desire, then we have to struggle and work and do all kinds of things in order to satisfy that desire. And often we're frustrated and there's a lot of tukka associated with the satisfaction of this hunger, of that common kind of quenching. But the quenching of Nipan, in which there is no hunger, it is free of all those problems and struggles and tukka. It's beyond this worldly kind of quenching. It's a transcendent quenching when there's no hunger, no thirst, and no desire. Which of these is higher? Can you, can you see the difference? Which of these is, is better? The, the quenching of hunger satisfied or the quenching of no hunger? If we examine life carefully, we'll see that the desire for quenching is an instinct. This is a fundamental instinct in all living things. All living things have a desire to quench hunger, to quench thirst. And so we can see this in all levels of life. We can see in the mosquito it has a hunger and so it, it sucks our blood in order to quench its desire for blood. Or we can see the young infant quenching its desire by sucking milk from its mother's breast. Or when we're hungry, we want to quench that hunger. We have a, a desire, an instinctual desire to quench that hunger. And so we look for food. We can see this instinct, this desire to quench in all levels of life. And as we grow beyond the infant, as we become adults, we have more complicated hungers, but still we always want to, we're trying to quench these desires, the desire for fame. And we go about doing things in order to quench the desire to be famous or to be respected or liked, or the desire for, for sex. We, we look for ways to quench this desire in order to, to experience that coolness. 
there are countless examples of this in our everyday lives, of this instinct of quenching desire. But most of the ways we go about this are very fleeting and temporary. And so it, here we're looking for a way to quench these desires that will quench all desire. This, this need or instinct to quench desire. We're looking for something that can quench them all, not just a little bit here and a little bit there for a few moments or a few minutes, but something that can quench all desire in order to respond to this, this basic instinct which we can observe in all living things and most of all ourselves. The, the strongest or the most powerful kind of desire or craving is the desire of the defilements, defiled desire, defiled craving. This is the, high, hard, <coughs> the hottest, most powerful kind of craving. And Nipan, Nipan is the quenching of these defiled desires, hateful desires, greedy, lustful desires, confused, deluded desires, the quenching of all these defiled desires which every one of them comes from ignorance, from not knowing things the way they are. And so there arises these foolish, silly, defiled wants and desires. The highest Nipan, the final Nipan, quenches all of these kinds of desires, all these defiled <coughs> desires. And so this brings us to the third understanding of Nipan, which is Nipan as the goal of life, the final goal of life, or the final destination of life. If we understand that quenching is a fundamental instinct in all life, then we will understand that the final goal or destination of life is the supreme quenching, the highest quenching, the final quenching of Nipan, in which all these defiled, foolish, ignorant desires are quenched. So this, this third value of Nipan is the, the destination or the goal of life. All life is heading for Nipan. All, all life seeks and tends towards Nipan. But, the, but there is this struggle, there is this constant struggle for, for this quenching. We are always going about it in, in ways that our struggles, our competitions, because we don't quite know how to go about it in the, the best or the wisest way. So there is all this struggle for Nippon. But in all life, in plants, in trees, in animals, in human beings, in anybody's life, whether from Asia or the West, no matter what class we come from, what language we speak, what profession we have. In all our lives, we are struggling for Nippon. We are struggling for this and then until we can reach this final destination, there will be nothing but struggle. We'll continue struggling, we'll continue traveling and wandering all over the place until we reach this destination point, the destination point of life, which is Nippon. There's no other place where all this traveling and struggling ends, but in Nippon. No matter where we go, there will be struggles and hassles, and all of that will only end in the final quenching, the ultimate supreme quenching of Nippon. 
There is no life, whether plant, animal, or human, that goes anywhere else or can go beyond Nippon. It is the final goal of all life, where all the, all the struggles, all the hassles, all the problems, all the travels cease and are quenched in Nippon. Whether you know about Nippon or not, whether you understand what we're talking about or not, whether you're interested in it or like it or not, regardless of what you think or believe or like or dislike, your life is struggling for Nippon. No matter what you're thinking, your life itself, the life force, the nature of life, is to struggle, to search for Nippon. And this is going on whether you're conscious of it or not, whether you are willing to admit it or not, whether you're interested in it or not. It's still a fundamental instinct in all life, most of all in your own life. It's there if we can start to, start to notice it and accept this fact. When we can be consciously aware of this Nibbana, this Nippon instinct, then we are able to cooperate with life. Instead of all our crazy thinking, following selfish desires, we can start to think in ways that are about cooperating with life. We can work together with life for, to work together for Nippon instead of egoistically trying to go in a different way. All life seeks Nippon. This is the destination point of life. And so this is happening whether we're aware of it or not, whether we are interested in, in it or not. We might even think that we don't like Nippon, that we think it, it doesn't sound like the thing that we want. Regardless of that, it's what life wants, it's what life needs, and that's where life is going. Life is going to continue struggling for Nippon. It's just a matter of whether we're going to cooperate or not, work together with life, so that we can maybe truly realize this final quenching, the ultimate Nippon. So now you have the opportunity to understand Nippon in these three ways. There's Nippon as that which preserves, sustains, and nourishes life, that which quenches in order, which quenches life so that life can go on, so that we can survive. This is the first meaning. The second meaning is the sumambanam that is beyond all good and evil, that quenches all good and all evil, that quenches all dualities. And the third meaning is nipan as the final destination of life, the goal of life that you can't escape from. Life will be a ceaseless and constant struggle until this destination point is is achieved. So these are three meanings of the word Nippon. If you understand them, then you will understand the benefits and advantages of Nippon or of a new life. When this final goal of life is realized, then there is what we call a new life, the quenched life. Nippon, if you want to call it the quencher, you think about it and see if that's the right word to use. But at least understand these three meanings and understand the benefits and the value of Nippon, of a new life. And so now we come to one last question, which is, if that's what Nippon is, what do we do in order to, to realize Nippon? The answer to this question is to, to practice vipassana, to practice the correct form of vipassana, 
and to do it in the correct way. Practice the kind of vipassana which the Buddha himself practiced and taught. This is the, the path or the way to the final goal of life, to Nipan. So, for this reason, please be very, very interested in vipassana. Give it sufficient time and energy in order to practice it correctly, in order to realize the, the true benefits of vipassana or of meditation. So please practice vipassana with effort, patience, and do it correctly. Then you will realize these these benefits that we've been talking about. And this ends today's talk. <laughs>